Welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report, the region's longest running public affairs program. Legislative Report is a weekly review of activity at the state capitol featuring lawmakers from northeastern Minnesota. Most importantly, it's an opportunity for viewers to call or email their legislative questions and have them answered live on the air. Minnesota Legislative Report starts now. Hello and welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report. I'm your host, WDSC News and Public Affairs producer, Greg Grell. Well, it's just a few weeks left until adjournment. Lawmakers are now racing toward the end of the 2016 legislative session. Some very big differences are showing up on major bills in the DFL-controlled Senate and the GOP-dominated House. This is your opportunity to call with questions for the lawmakers that represent you. Locally, you can dial 218-788-2844. If you're calling from outside the local area, dial our toll-free number 1-877-307-8762. You can also email your questions to askmlr at wdse.org. And now it's time to introduce the legislators who are joining us in the studio. To my immediate left is Representative Eric Simonson, Democrat from Duluth. Welcome back. Thank you. Senator Roger Reinert, a Democrat from Duluth. Representative Mary Murphy, Democrat from Hermantown. And Representative Hello. Mike Sundin, also a Democrat from ESCO. And thanks to all four of you for being here today on a blustery, windy day. Hopefully we'll have a lot of questions from viewers. But before we get into legislative news, Senator, or Representative Simonson, <laughs> you got the nomination yesterday to be, to go for actually Senator Reinert's seat. I uh, did. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about the nominating convention? Yeah, it was a good convention. There was a huge number of people that turned out yesterday and we had a really good convention. Uh, I think uh, by the time we started, it was a little after nine, but I think we got the endorsement somewhere around one o'clock, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it went well. Feels good to get that behind us, and then uh, we can focus on finishing out this session. Now, former Duluth City Councilor Sharla Gardner was also uh, in the running for the nomination. She's uh, going to be supporting you, so it was a pretty mm -hmm. amicable uh, process. It was very, it was very much so. And uh, you know, when it was over, and when the you know the ballots were counted, we all came together and uh, support one candidate, and it works really good when it works that way. Now, uh, the nominating convention is uh, something that uh, maybe. Uh, Folks who haven't been there before might want to know a little bit more about it. I heard there were a lot of new people there, but talk a little bit about it. Is it just sure. anybody can come to this convention, or how does it work? Sure. So in Minnesota, we have the caucus system that we just mm -hmm. went through on March 1st, and essentially uh, you go to your you know caucus with your particular party that you, you want to associate with, mm -hmm. and then at the caucus, the precinct caucuses, you can get elected to be a delegate to the next convention. Mm -hmm. uh, and in our case, it's the Senate District 7 convention. So we had... Um, well, I want to say between delegates and alternates that were elected, we had close to 700 people originally from the precinct caucus nights, but I think that we ended up seating around 400 and, well, let's say average, right around 450 delegates or so yesterday. But So people can get involved starting with the precinct caucus, they get elected from there, and then they can go on to the, to the next convention. And at that point, that's where we endorse, you know, as a party, we endorse uh, House members, Senate members, mm -hmm. um, county commissioner, Mm -hmm. That's what we did yesterday. And uh, Senator Reinert, uh, it's your seat that uh, Representative <coughs> Simonson is running for. How do you feel now that the process has moved along? You're kind of in your final weeks here as a, le <laughs> as a senator. <laughs> well, I think, first of all, congratulations to Eric. I uh, was a, an early and remain a strong supporter. I think he's going to, he's well positioned and he's going to do a great job representing Duluth uh, and the Duluth Senate seat uh, in the Minnesota Senate. But certainly yesterday was. Um, kind of a step on that, that path towards the next chapter in life. So uh, it was really rewarding to see the 500 plus people that participated yesterday. You know, I've been to many conventions and this was one where people came as alternates and did not get seated a, as a full-blown delegate. Um, and, and that doesn't often happen. So, um, you know, and I think we can, the DFL endorsement in this race means a lot. So the convention was meaningful and the, the fact that it was contested and well contested and Representative Simonson and, and uh, Councillor Gardner uh, really had a, uh, a good showing between the two of them. And I think that's important. You know, I've, I've been here talking about things like ranked choice voting and other methods because I believe choice, meaningful choice is important. And we sa certainly saw that yesterday, but I'm very happy with the outcome. Representative Sundin. It might be a good time to remind uh, the, your viewers and uh, the, the public in general that uh, uh, Senator Reinhardt's term doesn't end until January of next year, so 
they can still feel uh, comfortable calling them anytime, yeah. night or day. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and Representative Murphy, uh, d this was the Senate District 8 convention, or were Senate. there others uh, rolled into it? You mentioned that you attended. Well, I attended because I was interested, and mm -hmm. um, I'm an admirer of both Eric and Charlotte Gardner, and I was impressed with her gracious um, step back when she, when it was concluded, and uh, she was a very gracious, uh, she, her speech was very gracious, and she uh, pledged her support for uh, the next senator that's coming in. Um, it was uh, a good day in the sense that there was un uh, talks of unity throughout the day, and that was, I think that's important in this time. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my endorsing convention is until May, and uh, Mike's has already taken place, and uh, so there's still some things to come. Mm -hmm. And I think I misspoke, I said Senate District 8, yeah. Senate District Seven. 7. So, and I was gonna ask Representative Sundin about his, that's already happened, and Representative Murphy, yours is coming up in May. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. With rep representative um, from International Falls, Rob, Rob Eklund, Clint. and uh, Senator Bach. Okay. Well, let's move on now to uh, some of the major things that happened this week at the legislature. And I'll start with Senator Reinert. The budget bills are being put together right. in each respective house. Now, in the Senate, the DFL controls the process. Right. On the House side, the Republicans do. So we're coming up with major budget bills that have some major differences. So first talk about what's happened on the Senate side, then we'll talk about some of those differences. Right. Well, I think what you see, and, and I, I don't think you can really talk about one without talking about the other, because the differences are significant. And you know, as we look at this week, when both the House and Senate will pass supplemental finance bills, and, and you know, maybe it's worth taking a step back so our viewers understand, typically it's the odd numbered year when the legislature does the budget. During the recession, we all <laughs> dealt with the budget again and again and again. Well, now we're revisiting the budget because of the surplus. And is there an opportunity to make some targeted investments? And that's the, the Senate approach. So in a variety of areas, some people are familiar with, like uh, statewide broadband, you know, the Senate is making some key investments. Um, I think you're seeing a very different approach in, in the House of not many investments. Instead, um, tax relief of some different kinds and, and maybe uh, some other spending. So how that comes together and if it can come together, I think is really going to be an indicator for the, uh, the public of how successful this session will be. And you know, one of my concerns at this point, as you noted in the introduction, when we go back, we have less than a month, um, is will we do anything of substance because of these differences? And uh, you know, hopefully viewers are starting to get a little bit concerned about that uh, as they listen to the talk on both sides of the Capitol. Now you mentioned that the, during the, it, in the budget process, this isn't necessarily a budget year, but yet there are a number of budget bills. Why, why is that? Is that just supplements to what's happened in the previous year? Right. I, I mean, again, the, the budget surplus is at the table for that. You know, we could either do nothing with the surplus and it would just roll over for the next legislature to consider in the budget year. Um, the Senate is choosing to make some targeted investments and also reserving a good share of the surplus so that we maintain our, our good credit rating that we've worked to rebuild since the government shutdown uh, of a few years ago. Uh, and then the House has a, a different uh, approach as well. So, um, but I think how the House and Senate resolve that or if they resolve those differences is gonna be very telling for the rest of the session. The Representative Sundin, the re reality is that the bills passed by the House and the passed by the Senate probably in the end when the conference committee is done, they aren't gonna look anything like they do now. Is that kind of frustrating for you as a member of the minority? Uh, certainly is. Uh, it's, it's, it's like we're on the outside looking in uh, when you're in the minority and uh, you don't have a whole lot of influence on what's going on. And uh, you're, you're just uh, somewhat uh, helpless as far as even making a deal. So uh, the DFL is actually relying on the Senate and the governor quite a little bit to uh, carry the ball on uh, some of the more progressive issues and important investments. Now, Representative Murphy, the House Ways and Means Committee had an extremely busy week, and you've been doing a lot of uh, combining. You're a Ways and Means Committee member, is why I'm bringing the question to Representative Murphy. 
uh, you've been combining a lot of bills. What, what is the reason for that? Why are so many bills combined? I think I heard one, one of the bills, eight bills were down to one or something like that. But it seems like a lot of different things being merged into one bill. No, eight bills are down to three. Down to three, okay. <laughs> um, part of it is because the Senate is only going to have one bill. And um, we had, the Senate and the House had different expectations going in. Uh, the, the Finance Committees had the, from the House uh, had zero targets in four different areas, five different areas, and uh, no new spending, no new funding whatsoever. And uh, the Senate did have their Finance Committees each had some money for investment purposes, as using the word senator did. Um, but if it's, there's been talk that it would have been easier had the Senate and the House leaders gotten together and had the same targets. Mm -hmm. And that would have saved a whole lot of <laughs> consternation going on. But that didn't happen, and so uh, each of the finance committees did have uh, bills with some policy in and some money in. If there was money in to a finance committee like education, which had higher education had a zero target, and so did, meaning that they didn't have any new money whatsoever to spend. And the K or E through 12, early childhood through 12th grade, education bill had a zero target, meaning no in new investments. And yet the governor had some, in his proposal, had supplemental monies. And so if there was going to be any new money um, <clears throat> spent, that money had to come from already appropriated money from the 2015 finance bills that had passed. And uh, these finance bills, most of them did have some new investment and some new money that came out of um, careful uh, re refinancing uh, amounts that came from somewhere mm -hmm. that uh, is expected to follow through. And it carried them to a balanced budget. Each one of them was balanced, and so it was OK. But then they decided to merge um, like the two higher education and E through 12 education finance bill together with a vehicle that Representative Knobloch, who is chair of Ways and Means, uh, is going to be using. So I suspect that is the bill that is going to be the one that goes over to the Senate eventually as the vehicle for the conference committee of all finance bills. Well, let's move it over to the Senate side. Uh, Senator Reinert, why the difference between the two houses? Why is the Senate just doing one bill? Well, and I think Representative Murphy said something that it's important for folks to understand this, this mm -hmm. idea of targets. Mm -hmm. And that is a direction from leadership in each body. Uh, and it really indicates where the body's priorities are. So the fact that there were five areas, I think, in the House that had zero targets meant, you know, these were areas where House leadership wasn't interested in doing uh, any, any new projects. And in the Senate, uh, we didn't have that. All of our budget areas had targets. The other thing I think is going to be really important as we try to figure out um, you know, some sort of a landing for the session is, uh, and this happened last year too, the majority in the House likes to put policy provisions in their finance, their budget finance bills. And that becomes really problematic because in the Senate, we separate. There are policy bills and there are finance bills. We don't mix the two. And, and frankly, that's good for viewers at home. You can watch people take votes on bills that are about spending and revenue. And you can watch the votes people take on policy provisions. But when you intertwine the two, especially as you merge bills together, as you sort of intro, intro this section talking about, it becomes really not transparent for the viewers at home. Um, and it becomes really difficult for the two bodies to work together because there are policy provisions that the House is going to lop onto, onto some spending bills, and we might be willing to go along with those spending priorities, but there are policy provisions that uh, the Senate majority is probably going to 
disagree with strongly. So th that also is going to be, I think, a problem as we enter these last few weeks. Now, Representative Simonson, uh, in some of these bills that are coming out, uh, what are you seeing for local impact uh, right now with some of the House bills? Uh, and uh, what's your opinion of what's uh, happening right now? There's not a lot good coming out of the House bills, <clears throat> I have to say, especially when you, you know, kind of go back to last year when the, when the session opened with kind of a theme of this is going to be about greater Minnesota. Um, <clears throat> I'm seeing just the opposite, quite frankly. For example, on the House side, you know, everybody in greater Minnesota is talking about broadband these days. Four years ago, you couldn't get anybody to talk about it. Now it's all everybody talks about. Um, in our jobs committee, we, we passed our bill out of committee last week and sent it to Ways and Means. But in that bill, for example, uh, you know, the House GOP is, is dedicating $15 million towards broadband, which is not a lot of money. But the point is that they took it out of the job creation fund to spend it on broadband because they had a zero target. So we're cutting the programs that create jobs in greater Minnesota in order to invest $15 million in broadband. That's not good policy. And these things will never see the light of day. I mean, that's, that's the reality because they'll never get through the Senate and certainly would never get past the governor. Um, so it's frustrating because we, we waste a lot of time doing that. Representative Sundin, being uh, you said in the greater Minnesota economic and workforce development policy, that's gotta be a frustrating situation for you then as well. Uh, very much so. Uh, just to finish up on the broadband conversation, next month I'll be uh, going to Boston for th a three-day seminar on broadband. And uh, Chair Hoppy, Republican Chair uh, of the uh, Commerce Committee, has chosen me and along with another uh, representative from the Republican side to go and uh, learn about broadband, learn about the cable systems, and uh, become a little more proficient in our uh, decision making on this. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'd have to thank him for that. And uh, looking forward to becoming a little more, uh, well, better educated and a little more. Uh, uh, capable of making good decisions on the broadband issues. And on that, just uh, a side note, on the 12th of May, I've got uh, Lieutenant Governor Tina Smith coming up to Kettle River, Minnesota, and, and she's gonna be talking about the broadband issues and firefighting issues and uh, a few other uh, topics. So it's, uh, I'm gonna stay on it, and uh, the investment that the Republicans have uh, offered in the House is just woefully inadequate. I'm. Uh, more in line with the Senate and, of course, the governor's proposal as well. So, All right, before we move on from uh, budget issues, anything anybody else would like to add? Uh, we may get some questions from viewers. Well, there is $7 million plus dollars in the education bill that did pass for broadband to schools. And uh, so that schools could use it to exchange information with other schools even. And so but it's not enough. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we'll uh, take some questions from viewers that we've been getting in, and we'll start out with a question for Representative Sundin. Gary from Cloquet is wondering, is there a possibility for getting additional funding for the Big Lake Area Sanitary District through the bonding bill? A couple weeks ago, we had this question. There was no update, but today there is, correct? That's an affirmative on that. Uh, the uh, final investment, I believe it's a $1.5 million investment to complete that project. Uh, the commitment is both in the Senate bill and the uh, in the House uh, bonding proposal, so it looks very, very good. So it's all we need to do is get a bonding issue, right. <laughs> a bonding bill. So. And for viewers awesome. who aren't familiar, can you talk a little bit about that Big Lake Area Sanitary System? The Big Lake Area Sanitary District uh, has been formed uh, to service the area around Big Lake, which lies west of Cloquet. It'll be a forest sewer main that goes around the lake and then up Big Lake Road to pick up an additional 115 services and it'll connect into the WLSSD system in the city of Cloquet and then uh, it'll be treated uh, down here in Duluth. There's plenty of capacity here in Duluth and uh, uh, it's uh, overdue with all the failing sewer systems and mound systems around that lake. It's a very, very important thing to do. So good news for water quality, Senator Reinhardt. Well, I was just going to add, I mean, that is one of the themes of not just the session, but of, of a bonding bill. It's about that sort of core infrastructure that we often take for granted. Sewers aren't sexy. We don't think about them often. Uh, until they back up in your basement. Or overflow, as we <laughs> dealt with in Duluth, right? So you have this, this uh, hopeful expansion to cover Big Lake on one end. 
You know, meanwhile, we've got another provision that we're working on that's part in my district, part in Senator Box with the, the North Shore uh, sanitary sewer line, which was constructed a few years ago, but turned out to be quite expensive because of rock and terrain. So those folks actually now are paying the highest sewer rates in the, in the state of Minnesota. Um, so there's, that's part of the bonding bill. And then, of course, we all have been working on a proposal for WSD um, that would allow them to use some of that excess capacity uh, that Mike was talking about in order to generate, basically generate some of their own revenue and, and help keep rates affordable uh, and position themselves for the next 50 years of the system. So, you know, a lot of times people get caught up in the bonding bill and, you know, kind of front uh, page articles, but it's really these sorts, the big lake, the North Shore, the WSD projects that are what a, a bonding bill is all about. And, um, you know, Mike, Mike sort of said something at the end that I think is really important. If there is a bonding bill, uh, and we really need to track that carefully as we move forward. I, I think there's some reason to be concerned that the House majority may only do roads and bridges and none of these other infrastructure projects. And, you know, in the Senate, we're not going to think that that's a, a path forward. There are too many other critical projects like Big Lake and North Shore and WSD that need to get done as well. And I'm going to move on to Representative Sundin in just a moment, but you mentioned the North Shore system. We actually had gotten some inquiries about that. So that is currently... Uh, in the bonding bill on the Senate side? Well, actually, what we did on the yeah. Senate side, uh, um, on the first, I think the first step, there's some of these projects because we have a surplus could either be cash or bonding, and the North Shore one uh, fits into both projects. Senator Bach is the chief author, um, and the first uh, um, path for that is actually going to be cash. We heard it. I expect it to be in our finance bill. But if for some reason that's not acceptable to the House Republicans, we have the option of that being a bonding project as well. And but for the viewers that are listening, uh, it, was, it did come out of committee. It should be in our final finance bill that we'll vote on this probably Wednesday. Yeah, Representative Murphy, you were shaking your head? I, I was shaking my head. It, 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 is, it does not qualify oh. as a bonding project because it is already built. Oh, true. Mm -hmm. And the, the debt and the interest on the debt keeps rising, and mm -hmm. so it keeps getting more expensive rather than less expensive, even though they have spent 10 years trying to buy it down. And so there, it needs cash, and the, um, there is support from the Public Facilities Administration or Authority Administration to spend cash on that project, and it is in the Senate bill but it is not in the House bill yet. So we'll have to wait and see on that. And Representative Sundin, you wanted to add something? Just to stick with the uh, sewer theme right here. Uh, <laughs> down in uh, uh, Moose Lake, uh, Windermere Township, uh, around Sturgeon Lake, there, there's uh, a great need for uh, uh, sewer treatment or uh, waste treatment down there. And uh, I'm carrying a bill that it should hit the floor this week and uh, it's a non-controversial bill. It just enables some of these uh, different entities, governmental entities, to enter into these agreements. Yeah, because down there, we're dealing with uh, several different townships and uh, a couple different municipalities and two different counties. So um, this legislation will enable them to form a, a, a new sewer district down there. So we're moving forward uh, down that area as well. So. All right, so we'll have to stay tuned to see what happens here in the end uh, when the session wraps up. Uh, Representative Simonson, we have a call from Mary in Buell. She's wondering, why is Minnesota one of the few states that still taxes Social Security? That's a, a federal program, Social Security. And why, are, why is Minnesota taxing that, Mary wonders? Well, <clears throat> it's a good question. Uh, it's one that we talk about a lot. Uh, we talk about, you know, Social Security pensions. We talk about veterans' pensions and, you know, whether we should or whether we shouldn't. Um, to totally exclude Social Security pensions uh, from income tax would be expensive. Um, so there's that issue because it would leave a hole in the general fund and you know, where does the money come from? But I get the sense that there's, there's a strong uh, interest in perhaps at least raising the threshold of the, of the dollar amount that we tax on Social Security pensions and perhaps veterans pensions as well. And uh, you know, maybe in the coming biennium we might see something move in that area. But uh, there's a strong argument about raising the threshold because it hasn't been touched for a long, long time. And, um, you know, I don't think, that I, I don't foresee that the discussion will ever go to a complete exemption, but I do foresee there's some interest, at least, in raising that threshold. 
And Senator Reiner, you serve on the Taxes right. Committee on the Senate side. Has there right. been any talk of that on the uh, in your committees? Not as much as there has been in the House. Um, I, I think that there is interest kind of along the lines that Representative Simonson said uh, on both this issue as well as we're one of the few states that also taxes military retirement um, income. Uh, and, you know, both of those were kind of non-issues or we're not going to talk about them when we were running billion dollar deficits but now that we are um, in a in the black I think there are conversations folks are interested in having I think the Senate perspective is we have those sorts of co conversations because they involve policies as well what is the right approach should it be weighted should it be graded should it should should it um, and that's what the budget year is for when we have five minute five months to work through the budget and the uh, the choices that go along with that. So I think Chair Scoy in the Senate uh, is interested in ha having that conversation, but I think he's probably more interested in having it next year uh, when the legislature will meet for a full five months. All right, and we have a call from uh, Betsy in Duluth. Betsy's wondering, Representative Sundin, I'll send this one to you first. State employees union contracts are pending legislative approval. Has there been any progress on state employee union contracts? Not that I know of, um, you know, it's not my uh, uh, scope of work down there, but uh, typically I don't uh, see where those contracts are going to be approved by a Republican House. Anybody else on the uh, on the panel here that knows? Yeah, I've been watching it a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's not been in front of my committee, but I've been watching it, and mm -hmm. I think, you know, sadly, they're getting caught up in the mixture of what is politically unnecessary. Um, and my hope is still, and I don't have high hopes, but my hope is by the end of the session that reality comes around and we just pass the contracts because the fact of the matter is they were fairly negotiated um, and there's money to, you know, uh, there's money there available to cover the cost of the contract. So we ought to just do our job and just approve them, but they're being held up by the GOP house. Is there precedent for contracts not being approved by the legislature and what would happen if they weren't approved? Well, if a contract's not approved, the, the existing contract stays in effect until the next one is approved. So even if it goes beyond the quote unquote expiration date, it stays in, it stays in effect. But that's not the best way to do business with your employees. Um, it's the responsibility of the legislature to approve what you know, management has negotiated with the union. And, and if we don't do that, we're, we're, uh, we're not doing our work. All right. Uh, Representative Sundin, the House Transportation Committee finalized a list of about $350 million in potential projects. I'm assuming those are bonding projects. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit, what the projects are? What do you think of the priorities that have been set by the committee? Uh, the, the lead uh, Democrat on the Transportation Committee, Frank Hornstein, is uh, passionately uh, uh, involved with real safety. Mm. And uh, that's been brushed aside quite a little bit. Uh, as far as the projects that are being uh, proposed, that's statewide. And uh, last week they got uh, several of those projects, I believe it was close to 50 of them, got uh, a five minute hearing. So the chances of those being addressed are pretty low. Uh, with, and they did the same thing last year, but uh, there, there's one project there that I, I carried uh, and got a five minute hearing and uh, I anticipate that's going to be heard by capital investment again, that Highway 73 project in Cromwell, and uh, I'm hopeful of that. But uh, it's all big talk at this point until the, the big deal is made at the end of the session here. And Senator Reinert, uh, this has been one of the big issues of this right. session is transportation funding. How do we do it? Right. What gets fixed? Where are we at on the Senate side? Well. On the Senate side, we've already got a bill that was in conference committee last year during the budget session when a bill should have been passed, much like a tax bill should have been passed. So I was ready to answer a different question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, where are we going to be at the end of this session? And yeah. I don't think we're going to be anywhere um, because there is such a big disagreement on, there's no disagreement on the fact that, the, that we don't have the revenue to sustain Minnesota's infrastructure at the level that Minnesotans expect it to be. Um, you know, and, and there will be folks at home that will disagree with that coming out of the gate. But I think when you take a look at the numbers, it's not just roads and bridges, it's roads, it's bridges, it's airports, it's ports, it's transit, it's pedestrian ways, you know, the bike paths we love to use, those are all part of transportation. And so that bill that's been in conference committee since 2015 is really meant to address those in an ongoing way. And I think the Senate uh, uh, Transportation Committee, of which I'm a member, would say let's have that conversation, let's figure that out. 
It doesn't have to be just our way. It doesn't have to be just the house way. Maybe there's a mix of revenues. But you know, anyone who looks at it knows that as ve you know, we really rely heavily on the per gallon gas tax. As vehicles become more fuel efficient or non-gas vehicles become more prevalent, that trend line continues to go down and expenses just with inflation continue to go up. And that's a, a, a toxic mix, mix over the long term. So, but unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see uh, leadership in, in the House and Senate find a way in the few re weeks we have remaining to figure that out. And uh, if not, I, I think voters should keep that in mind as they go to the polls in November. You know, this was a major task. Everyone identified it as a priority, and in two years, we really did not make any significant progress on it. And Representative Sundin, has there been any talk? Uh, Senator Reinhardt basically said the, the, the system is broken. We aren't getting enough money in. Is there any substantive talk about an alternative way of raising money to repair roads and bridges? Well, they're, they're looking at uh, taxation of the uh, auto parts. Uh, being dedicated to the highway fund, but that there again, if you take that revenue out of the general fund, that leaves a hole over there. It's just a shift. It's a gimmick, and it's uh, it's. I think it's time for us to step up with a, uh, an increase in the gas tax. I know that's risky talk, you know, raising taxes on anybody, but the fact is, we've, as a general public, we've inherited one pretty good transportation system, the interstate highway system, mm -hmm. some pretty good roads in Minnesota, but we're watching them deteriorate and these bridges uh, actually collapsing in Minnesota or Minneapolis. And uh, it's time to step up and do a better job and it's gonna take some money. Mm -hmm. All right, well you are watching Minnesota Legislative Report. Uh, it's your opportunity to call in and uh, question your, your own lawmakers here with questions about the session. Representative Murphy, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the budget bills that the Ways and Means Committee heard this week. One of them, uh, the agriculture, environment, and natural resources, and job growth and energy affordability bills were merged into one. Can you talk a little bit about that, uh, if we haven't already touched on it? Well, the, the recommendations that, that were in the agriculture bill uh, were primarily, um, things that are nice to do not essential. The essential things were done last year. And, uh, and then the other one that you mentioned, we've already touched upon mm -hmm. um, with the jobs. And, and that was the bill, with, that was another group that didn't have any new money. And uh, so they talked policy. Mm -hmm. And that's what's, what's in those bills. But I, I don't know all the um, details. Uh, we tried to amend in a few cases on those and always our amendments fail. Mm -hmm. And um, the conversation was uh, brought out by the people, mostly by the people and the members of who sit on those committees and were talking about that they weren't as good as they could have been. and. Uh, yet the bills passed uh, substantially. Mm -hmm. The key thing is that the bill passes and it goes to the floor and the floor will have the same discussion and the floor will have another opportunity to try to amend them and maybe make them better. But we probably won't win on those amendments either. But the most important thing is to get them passed off the floor to the conference committee and then the conference committee can make the decisions on where we're going. Mm -hmm. I'm, Senator but it's, Oop, I'm sorry. We have to remember it, Senator said it, it's not an appropriation year, mm -hmm. it's not a year for policy, and therefore it shouldn't take a whole lot of conversations between the House conferees and the Senate conferees to come up with a bill that gets us out of there by May 23rd. Mm -hmm. Senator Reiner? Well, I just, I would use a real concrete example to build on what Representative Murphy was saying. And, and it also was a good example of how the House and Senate, you know, that, that bicameral thing our founding fathers gave us works uh, and, and, and can work well. Uh, one of the issues I've been tracking really closely is, is the uh, base funding at UMD. You know, we're here on, on the UMD campus at WDSC. And, They've had this growing challenge of being, you know, not a small campus like a Crookston or a Morris or a Rochester, and yet also not Minneapolis. Uh, 
um, but being treated as though they were a Crookston or a Rochester uh, or Morris. Uh, and with the student body and the diversity of programs, including graduate programs, you know, that model doesn't seem to be working. And so one of the things we did in the Senate was add some language um, in the, uh, the budget bill around that appropriation to the university saying, tell us, tell us how you make these internal budget decisions. Uh, many folks don't know, but the university is autonomous. It, it was born before the state of Minnesota was, so it has a lot of freedom that other systems don't have. Um, and I think we'll see us try to dig into that maybe a little bit more. Um, that report came back and it was informative, but there still is a question around what do you do with a medium-sized campus? It's not small, it's not Minneapolis, it's somewhere in between. And as long as we get that to conference in one body, it could be the House, it could be the Senate, we get to have that conversation again. And, and Representative Murphy was talking about that. And I think that's important for people to know as they're tracking maybe a particular project or something they're really passionate about. And, oh, it didn't happen in the Senate, but it happened in the House. Well, great. I mean, it's going to go to conference, and that's where we'll have a chance to, you know, in one body convince mm -hmm. the other that it mm -hmm. ought to be there in the end. Uh, Representative Simonson, uh, you sit on the tax committee. I think you had your last official hearing this week, uh, and a fair tax proposal was heard. Talk about that a little bit. What is that all about? Well, it's an interesting proposal. It's not a new proposal. This is talked about a lot, especially at the federal level. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually brought up and talked about and then eventually dismissed. Uh, but this was not an official hearing. It was more of an informational hearing. And mm -hmm. essentially what it does is it gets rid of uh, you know, essentially every every sense of an income tax that you've ever had, right, in Minnesota. It, and it replaces it with a sales tax on just about everything at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I mean, things that aren't taxed today are things like prescription drugs or the rent that you pay. And regardless of who you are and where you would live in Minnesota, you would pay a higher sales tax on everything, including items like that. And food and clothing, right? Which Correct, are, right. It's, which aren't it's virtually everything. Yep. Which aren't currently taxed. Um, which so aren't this would eliminate taxed. the income tax and s shift it to a sales tax. Correct. But now keep in mind that you have to reach a certain threshold of income before you actually pay a net income tax here in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, but this mm -hmm. fair tax doesn't necessarily understand that, and it taxes people at the lower income thresholds <coughs> at a higher rate because now we have, you know, be, Let's say if you're in the city of Duluth, you're you know you're paying like seven, seven and a half percent, whatever that the sales tax is, and this would require probably eleven or a twelve percent sales tax, which on top of that on, city tax. Well, no, the total sales the total tax sales, that, total that we would have to pay, yeah. and um, you know at first blush it looks okay, but when you start thinking about people that are making twenty and twenty-five thousand mm -hmm. dollars a year, mm -hmm. that are you know they're paying relatively low, if any, income tax at all, and now they're going to be paying you know, five or six percent higher sales tax rate and applying it to everything. It's, it's not the best system. It's designed really to help people at the, t the upper tiers of the income threshold. So we heard it, now we can put it away. And Representative Murphy, you've been around <coughs> the legislature for a while. This, this issue comes up from time to time, uh, hasn't made any progress. Do uh, you think there's any progress being made this time? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Representative Sundin? <coughs> Income tax, uh, we should note that uh, in the last session we did uh, establish a fourth tier and uh, that provided that uh, new tier for the higher incomes and uh, the economic uh, productivity of the state has given us this surplus. So I, I think we've been very successful. Eric was a good part of that in the House and uh, very successful in uh, straightening out the finances of the state. Minnesota to revert to something like that would uh, mean disaster for <coughs> most of the lower income people in the state and it would there's nothing fair about that whatsoever. So. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to comment on that? Well I mean uh, from the Senate side it's a yeah. non-starter yeah. um, so you know the question of is it going anywhere no it's not going anywhere um, and, and frankly it it's bad tax policy you know I've had the um, I actually enjoy tax policy and I've had the chance to serve on the tax committee both the House and the Senate you know, we in Minnesota have a really well-balanced um, pool of revenue. You know, we rely on property taxes, which are considered regressive, meaning they're not based on your ability to pay. And, you know, that becomes challenging for older or fixed income individuals. We also have income tax, which is, which is progressive. It's based on your ability to pay. And those who make more, pay more. And in the middle, we have sales tax. 
which is sort of a mix. Um, you know, people with more income tend to buy more, so they're going to pay more sales tax. People at the lower end of the income spectrum are still going to buy some things. So it's considered regressive, but not heavily regressive. And we mix all three of those. Uh, former Revenue Commissioner Myron Franz went around the state for a good year talking about this three-legged stool and how it needs to be imbalanced and that, you know, and as we think of uh, the economy, diversity is a good thing. Uh, and so you don't want to go all in on one thing, in this case, a switch to an all-consumption tax. And, you know, Minnesota really has done well. We're outperforming our region. We're outperforming the country. Um, our budget is in the black. We are stable. Our ratings are good. I don't know anyone on the Senate side who would think that, that uh, drastically changing that is a good idea. We have sound tax policy in Minnesota. Uh, we should continue to move in that direction. And Representative Simonson, on the same uh, taxes issue, broad issue, uh, Chuck from Pengilly is wondering if there's any potential for property tax relief. He says his property taxes have risen greatly this year without any home improvements. So. Uh, any property tax relief on the horizon uh, this session? Well, I think you know the thing to keep in mind is that residential property tax is set by the local jurisdiction. Right. Um, so whether it be the city, the county, the township, uh, school district, what have you, um, what we do, you know, from a state perspective to try to we can provide some direct relief. You know, that's an option. Or I think one of the better ways that we can provide uh, the best individual property tax relief is by investing in local government aid and county program aid and township aid and those are the things that help keep local government uh, property taxes lower mm -hmm. and you know we I think as the House Democrats would like to invest additional monies into those programs but again it's it's a non-starter with the House GOP mm -hmm. but um, you know we'd like to do more in terms of direct property tax relief for for residential homeowners but I don't see it happening this year. Anything on the Senate side that uh, could uh, provide property tax relief? I mean, not this session. Um, you know, and I, I'm, um, it's, it's unfortunate to hear that the property taxes are going up because we made a concerted effort a couple years ago to invest heavily in LGA and county program aid, township aid. In fact, in 2013 or 14, both Representative Simonson and I got awards from the League of Minnesota Cities because we took on the challenge of trying to rebalance the formula for local aid as well as significant investments in it. But what we've seen is even though the state has been a good partner on that uh, over the last couple of years, there was about a decade of disinvesting. Uh, when I served on the city council, every year at the end of the year, it seemed we had cuts to local government aid that meant we had to either cut services or raise property taxes. And so after a decade of that, even though the state is being a better partner in investing heavily, you see local government still trying to catch up from some unmet needs. So. You know, what I would say is, um, you know, hang in there as best you can. Hopefully next year in the budget session, the legislature will consider uh, increasing investments in those local partnerships. Um, in Minnesota, it's the state and local partnership that's the most uh, um, fundamental thing we have. And what about attack, attending your local tax hearings? There's usually hearings. Uh, you might be able to um, make a statement that why does this go up? Is this fair? Uh, I don't know how often that succeeds. Anybody on the panel uh, see that happen, Representative Sundin? Is that an effective way of, uh, of uh, maybe trying to rein in those uh, property taxes? Well, I've been to the, some of those hearings myself, and it didn't work for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think it has worked for some people when it's... If they can show their case. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And then there's another avenue that for individuals can take is to go to tax court. Mm -hmm. And that travels around the state on a regular basis. and. Uh, panel of three judges uh, listens to the issue, and sometimes the consumer wins. All right. Well, some good advice, and thank <laughs> you. Uh, Representative Sundin, now, William in Saginaw is wondering about, uh, we talked about broadband earlier. He's wondering, is there anything you can do, or, can, or is there anything that can be done about unreliable Internet service? His provider has not provided him service for the last two weeks. I'm not going to mention the provider. <laughs> but, uh, I think I know who the provider is, but <laughs> uh, regardless, uh, we, we need uh, a better service for these underserved areas. Mm -hmm. You know, there's unserved areas that are remote and, you know, it's going to be quite some time, you know, before they uh, get any, any type of real service. But these underserved areas are uh, definitely something we need to concentrate on. That's the difference when, between the investment that we're, we've been talking about. And uh, locally, I'm going to uh, work uh, to make certain that everybody in my area is applying for these grants, whatever the amount is, so they uh, can, uh, can capitalize on that. And Saginaw is one of those areas. 
And often uh, folks who live in rural areas also don't have the advantage of competition. They often only have one choice, and uh, some of these companies right. don't have a lot of technicians. Right. If you have a problem, it takes a long time to get a service provider out. Is there anything the state can do for that uh, type of a situation, Representative Sundin? It just comes down to investment again, you know, and we're at the mercy of uh, those companies that are trying to make money mm -hmm. providing this service. And uh, you know they, they've got to run their balance and uh, s stay in the uh, black ink as well. So mm -hmm. it's 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 a tough juggling act, actually. Yeah. Senator Reiner. Well, and I think I think Mike has framed it correctly. You know, you have population centers where a company, a for-profit company, can make money, and they're naturally going to be uh, drawn there. Well, we have other corners of the state where a, a profit's very difficult to make, uh, and attracting a provider there uh, who provides good, fast, reliable service is challenging. You know, we think back, the phone service was not uh, unlike this issue. We had big parts of the state that, you know, where folks had to get together and form rural phone cooperatives in order to provide e each other's service. So there are certainly parts of the state where there is uh, a reason for the state to get involved, and you see that in the governor's call to action and the response from it, the House uh, uh, and also the Senate and a, a little bigger amount of money. And what I would say on this issue, why should we care? I mean, if we think that Minnesota is well poised because we have well-educated, talented people that could live anywhere and um, help move our economy forward, you gotta have the infrastructure to do it. Much as we've always said in Duluth, we are blessed because we have a freeway, a port, an airport, railroads, all those sorts of things. We can have a thriving economy and not have to move to Minneapolis, St. Paul. Broadband allows people throughout every corner of Minnesota to do the very same thing. So it, it's smart for us to make sure that service is there. And Representative Sundin? I tell a story about my father as a high school student and a young man. He'd go out and uh, uh, practice a trade as an electrician for at, at one point, and he'd go in and wire these houses. He was capable and knew the code and out in these you know remote rural areas. And those houses were wired, but there was no electricity yet. So, you know, it's, it's, it's the same thing as it was 80, 90 years ago. People are waiting for that service, and they know it's going to come. But uh, ba ba back then, it was, there was a more realistic investment in, the, in, in that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we, we need to step up. Mm -hmm. All right, we have about 10 minutes left. So if you have a call, uh, if you have a question, make that telephone call right now. We'll get it in like Vicki from Duluth did. This is for Representative Simonson. And she says, now that you've gotten the, uh, the nomination for the Senate, what are you going to do pre to preserve northern Minnesota wildlife and prevent overdevelopment from farming and mining, et cetera? So apparently you're already having your feet held to the fire, <laughs> <laughs> Representative Simonson. Well, I hadn't expected that question. That's a good question. <laughs> Um, you know, here's here's my answer, and uh, it you know if it sounds vague, it's because it's it's early yet. But mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I've worked really hard to develop relationships with um, a lot of different groups, including environmental groups um, and labor groups and business groups, quite frankly. And I think that there's always a balancing act, um, and and that's the important piece is to make sure that when you're talking about you know, whatever the issue is, whether it be, you know, logging or mining or business development or expansion of residential property, is that you make sure that you listen to all the groups that are affected. And that's one of the things that I, that I want to do going forward is making sure that we do a lot of listening. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I've learned just in the last, you know, four or five months that I've been uh, campaigning for, for this endorsement is that there's, there's a big difference between East Duluth and West Duluth. Um, West Duluth, I'm very familiar with, you know, kind of how the the population thinks and what they believe in, and East Duluth is, is different. So over the course of the next few months, we'll be spending time just trying to understand what that is. But you know, the answer is that we listen to everybody that has a stake in it. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, we have a question from Stephen Duluth, and he may have heard some of the conversation, and Representative Sundin, we know where you stand on this on the gas tax, but he's wondering where the other lawmakers stand on the gas tax. So I'll just go down if you missed it. Representative Sundin said he thinks it might be time to raise the gas tax to help pay for infrastructure. Well, Representative Murphy, are you, are you on the same page on that issue? What do you think of a gas tax increase? Well, I think we need to consider subs sustain <laughs> sustainable um, ways of paying for our highways and our bridges and our upkeep of all the roads and bridges that we have and, and highways in the state. And if we don't have a sustainable way, a new sustainable way of paying for it, then we have to increase the gas tax because 
of all the things that Senator Reinert said is uh, if we have more efficient cars, we have many more drivers on the roads using the cars and or using the roads and cr wearing them out, so to speak, and the bridges. And we have to have money in the only proven over a long period of time sustainable way ha that we've had that's been successful is gas tax. And if there aren't other methods, then we have to raise the gas tax. And I would think that we have to raise it not just a nickel, but I would think we have to raise it a dime. If there are other way, methods of sustainable ways to keep going forward as well as taking care of repairs, mm -hmm. then we should combine mm -hmm. and rethink the whole thing. But so far, we've got what we have in the bill that is in conference and hasn't been, they haven't met on for a long time, is the auto parts thing, which creates problems for the rest of the budget, and <coughs> um, one-time money from the surplus. Mm -hmm. That is not sustainable. That takes care of now and 2017, through 2017, but it doesn't take care of 2019, 18, 19, 20, 30. Mm -hmm. And so we have to come up with something. And right now, the only or the most, I don't want to say casual, but the most, uh, most prominent way of paying that's sustainable is the gas tax. Mm -hmm. And Senator Reinert, it's kind of the age old question, you know, we all want to have nice roads and right, bridges right. and highways, but we don't want to pay for them. So. I, I laugh a little because I, I have a feeling the caller wanted, you know, yes or no questions from all of <laughs> us. And this is not a yes or no topic. You know, we could do an hour just on transportation if we were to do it thoughtfully and, and do it justice. And, you know, I guess I could say anything. I'm not, it's unlikely we will vote on anything this session and I won't be there next year. But here is the reality and we've touched on it a couple times now. The per gallon gas tax in and of itself is not sufficient. I've come to the conclusion that it is uh, an archaic method for revenue around transportation. If we do the things we want to do in terms of fuel efficiency, we will continue to have a dwindling source of revenue. So I'm a firm believer that there needs to new, be a new mix. Much as we talked about that mix of general fund revenue, there needs to be a mix of transportation revenue. Part of it is a, ga a per gallon gas tax. We're used to that. Part of it maybe is a sales tax because the sales tax moves as the price increases or decreases instead of gallon usage. Part of it maybe is a mileage base. Those who use the system more would pay more to do it. Talking about that progressive thing we talked about earlier. Part of it is we have to go back and revisit um, the uh, value tax we pay on vehicles. You know That was really flattened out under one uh, Jesse Ventura who did you know, a few other things along that line that tended to blow holes in the state budget that we're still trying to figure out how to uh, move forward on. You know, we haven't talked yet this session, Greg, about the Purple Caucus, but it's been very active in the Senate. And on transportation, we really have had agreement between D's and R's on a couple things. Number one, let's look at the system. What is the size of the system and what can the state continue to maintain along with our local partnerships? And then two, what would be the right mix of revenue? And there's disagreement on ind individual pieces, but there's agreement that there's a mix that needs to be there and not just a particular source of revenue. And Representative Simonson, we have about three minutes left and I'd like to get to one more question after this. So first, uh, your point of view on the gas tax <laughs> or uh, alternative way of funding transportation. Well, yes, we need a new source of revenue, whether it be a gas tax or wholesale tax or some combination of new tax. We need new revenue and I'm 100% in support of that with the understanding that I just completed a legislative survey and I got responses back from several hundred residents of District 7B and 90% of them said yes to a gas tax. I mean, that's, that's a very compelling and strong message. Mm -hmm. Quick follow-up, Representative. Let's Sunday. remember that the uh, gas tax is a dedicated to the state right. uh, trunk fund, right. railway trunk fund, and mm -hmm. that can't be used for anything else. Constitutionally. All right, and Representative, or Senator Reinert mentioned the Purple Caucus. This is kind of related, but it's uh, 
an ode to uh, Minnesota's own Prince, Representative we Murphy. <laughs> we're, we're not going to sing. <laughs> Representative, we wouldn't want to do that. Representative Murphy, you're wearing purple. I heard you say that was because of Prince. There's actually a bill Senator Karen Housley is carrying or is just drafting to name Minnesota state color purple. Uh, purple caucus member here, <laughs> purple wear. First, let's just talk a little bit about Prince and what you think of that idea. I'm throwing it out there for you <laughs> first. <laughs> <To person. me. laughs> Fine with you're, me. You're wearing purple. I like state symbols. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So purple, great purple color for plenty. Minnesota. We got the Vikings, Vikings they're sure. purple, and Prince owns purple. He's the only uh, musician who had a color that went with him. Yeah, no. why not? <laughs> 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 Reference not so sure. I'm an Elvis fan. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, for all the fans out there, we'll see what happens, but maybe we'll have a state color. And I want to thank all each of you, Representative Sundin, Representative Murphy, Welcome. Senator Reiner, Representative Simonson, thanks for being here. We're out of time this week on Minnesota Legislative Report. I'd like to thank all the lawmakers again who make this program possible. Thanks to everyone who calls with their questions. Please join us again next Sunday for another live edition of Minnesota Legislative Report. For the crew here at WDSC, I'm Greg Grell. Have a great evening.